Okay, great. So well, welcome everyone. This is the fifth of six AAS sessions that form the meeting in a meeting on supermassive black hole studies with the legacy survey of space and time. This is session 301 of the AAS meeting. And in this session, we are going to have three speakers. We are first going to have Wei Zhang um, Yu, who will tell us about direct modeling of AGN optical variability using continuous time ARMA processes. And then we will have Yue Shen, who will tell us about AGN broadline reverberation mapping with the SDSS5 black hole mapper in the era of LSST. And then third, we will have uh, Andrew Robinson telling us about AGN dust reverberation mapping in the LSST era. Um, I will just remind you that during this session, the AAS Code of Conduct, as well as the AGN Science Collaboration Code of Conduct are in, in action. Uh, furthermore, we are recording this session uh, so that we're, we'll be able to share it with people who have interest later on who are not able to join. And finally, I will just mention that questions after each talk are strongly encouraged. We've budgeted time for that. Uh, you can use the Q&A button down at the bottom to, to put in your questions. Um, each talk will, I believe, will be about 20 minutes of speaking time, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and discussion. So I think we can start. Go ahead, Wei Zhang. All right, thanks, Neil. Um, so can you see my slide sign? All right, okay. Hi, uh, I'm Wei Xiang Yu. Uh, I'm a PhD student working with Gordon Richards at Drexel University. Today, I will uh, discuss some of our work, uh, some works we've done on direct modeling of AGN variability using continuous time armor process uh, and uh, some prospects for uh, LSST. So first, I would like to begin uh, with some uh, introducing some basic features of agent continuum variability, uh, just so that a uh, more general audience can uh, uh, get up to speed. So agent variability is a periodic and a stochastic. Uh, the variation of its brightness can go from 5% to 50% about mean flux. Uh, we thought it's uh, originally from the uh, creation disk of supermassive black holes. Uh, it can also be used uh, as a direct probe of innermost regions of AGNs. Lastly, there's a, uh, a well-established uh, anti-correlation between the amplitude of AGN variability and uh, the luminosity. Uh, not until very recently, there have been uh, enough good data to do uh, uh, direct modeling of AGN variability using light curves. One of the most uh, popular uh, uh, methods used to do such tasks task is called uh, Dampton random walk model. Uh, the power spectrum density of a power, uh, GIW model features a um, fixed slope of minus two at high frequency and a turnover uh, at low frequency. The structure function of a GRW model has a uh, fixed slope of one half and uh, it will plateau uh, after some decorrelation time scale. Uh, the advantages of doing direct modeling as compared to ensemble study is, uh, I think, is quite uh, apparent. Uh, here shows some correlation explored uh, between uh, the parameters of DRW and uh, and some physical properties of uh, of the AGNs uh, shown in Kelly et al. 2009. Here is anti-correlation between the perturbation amplitude and the luminosity, uh, another anti-correlation between the same parameter and the black hole masses, uh, uh, another uh, anti-correlation between the same parameter and uh, the Addington ratio. Uh, but not, not soon after uh, TRW gains popularity, uh, there have been uh, evidence showing deviations uh, from, uh, from the TRW. Uh, 
one of the most uh, direct one is uh, from the Kepler um, uh, Masovsky L2011 uh, uses uh, the light curves from Kep Kepler of a few uh, closely monitored HDN to show that the, uh, the best fit uh, slope of the PSD a high frequency uh, is are steeper than minus two as what is uh, predicted by a DRW model. Many other works has assured this, uh, this result from uh, different uh, perspectives. Then uh, there's a natural question to ask what would be a uh, better model that we can use uh, to analyze uh, the complexity of aging variability. Long before I started at Drexel, uh, people here, uh, in particular, Michael Vogley, Gordon Richards, uh, Richel uh, Kishro and uh, Jackie Moreno have been using Kama model to do uh, AG variability analysis. A Kama process is defined as the solution to this uh, differential equation, and the differential equation can be taken care of using two parameters, Q and Q. Q rep represent the highest uh, differential order on the left hand side, and Q represent a high differential order on the right hand side. In fact, DRW is just the lowest order. Uh, karma process, karma one zero. Uh, we uh, use in particular uh, karma two one or damped harmonic oscillator models to do uh, aging variability analysis. We can see there's two additional uh, parameters in DHOS compared to GRW that will provide uh, uh, more flexibility uh, while we do uh, uh, like her modeling. Another visual uh, illustration of the difference uh, in the PSD between the DRW and DHO. Uh, DRW PSD has a fixed slope of minus two, but uh, uh, in the, the PSD of DHO is allowed to do uh, go steeper than um, minus two. Now I'd like to go uh, a little bit deeper into how we interpret uh, uh, AJ variability modeling using karma process. So first we treat the dynamic system described uh, by the differential equation uh, as a input, filter, and response system. The terms on the right uh, characterize the input perturbation, and terms on the, right, uh, on the left uh, tell tells us how would the system respond uh, to a, a delta function uh, uh, impulse perturbation. We can rewrite the left hand side in the form of a classical damp harmonic oscillator. If you can recall from classical mechanics, uh, we can further uh, classify DH holes into underdamped, uh, critically damped, and overdamped uh, cases. Here we're only going to focus on the underdamped and overdamped cases. Uh, in the figures on the left uh, column, uh, first it shows what, how would the system respond to uh, to an impulse perturbation if, if the, the, uh, the system is underdamped. Uh, and the next two shows how would that respond uh, to an impulse uh, perturbation if the system is, uh, is, is overdamped. Uh, on the right, uh, we can see if we provide the same, even we provide the same input uh, perturbation, uh, given the config configuration of, of the response system is are, are different, either it's underdamped or overdamped, uh, the resulting light curves will have very distinct uh, features. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the model PSDs or DHOs, it actually provides a na some natural explanations for the observed deviations from DRW. Some have reported that they, uh, they didn't observe any apparent turnover at low frequency. Uh, Using DHO can it might just be a uh, relatively flattering, uh, like smoother uh, turnover instead of a sharp turnover predicted by DRW. Uh, like I just said, there's been uh, observed a deeper slope in the PSD at high frequency. This is possible for both overdamped cases and underdamped cases. Uh, lastly, DHO can also explain uh, some of the uh, QPO behaviors. Uh, in the light curves of AGM. Now let's move on to real data. So uh, we apply DHO analysis to Stripe 82 of AGNs using light curves from uh, CRTS and SDSS. 
we converted the best fit parameters to time scale, uh, a whole collection of time scales. Here I'm only showing like two of them, uh, tau rise and tau perturb. Just want to refresh your memory a little bit. Tau rise characterize how would the system, how soon the system will respond to an impulse perturbation. Uh, tau perturb gives the characteristic time scale of the input perturbation. If we uh, plot the overdamped DHOs in the perimeter space of tau perturb and tau rise, as shown on the left, we can see a natural splitting of two classes of overdamped DHOs. Uh, one population can be identified using the uh, darker blue color, uh, which has tau rise greater than tau perturb. Uh, another population uh, identified in uh, uh, darker blue, which has tau rise smaller than tau perturb. Uh, we also call this population uh, blue noise dominated DHOs. Now, if we look at the, uh, their uh, power spectrums and uh, structure functions, there are also very uh, notable differences. The lighter blue population has a very smooth featureless uh, structure function and power spectrum uh, density. But uh, the darker blue population features a second break in the structure function and the PSD. What's more interesting is that the uh, uh, in the in the in the blue noise dominated population, the per perturbation time scale is uh, uh, we found that the perturbation time scale is anti-correlated with the volumetric luminosity. Some other uh, uh, correlations we have uh, explored between the DHO parameters and the physical properties agents are also listed here. In the first column, we see anti-correlation between the amplitude of the DHO process and the luminosity. Third column shows uh, an anti-correlation between the DHO amplitude and uh, uh, the Anderton ratio. We don't see any apparent any cor uh, correlation in general between DHO amplitude and uh, black hole masses. Aside from uh, doing AG variability analysis, DHO modeling can also be used to do AG selection. Uh, the two figures show the distribution of, um, of, of quasars, uh, which is shown in green, and the periodic stars shown in purple in the nominal DHO space. So they can, I can see they can be separated in, the, in this parameter space. So after all this, uh, what we have learned uh, is uh, that uh, reliable uh, fitting of light curves, in particular using higher order common models, it's very, very difficult. Then what are the data qualities that we would uh, desire uh, to ensure that the results we get from those fittings uh, can be trusted? First, of course, we want high pre precision photometry. We need a good cadence, at least 60 epochs. Uh, in addition, ideally, we want the uh, observations to be distributed uniformly in the log delta T space. Delta T uh, is uh, the time separation uh, between any two observations in the light curves. Lastly, long baseline is always good, uh, in particular, especially for a long memory and high ZAGN. Here is a comparison of the CRTS and SDSS light curves in, that, in those few categories. Uh, CRTS apparently has a longer baseline, more epochs, uh, but if uh, like its error bars are um, larger than those from SDSS. Another figure shows how the observations are distributed and in the whole uh, across the whole range of time scales. SRTS provide a, uh, a quite even coverage in, in the whole time domain. Uh, however, the cadence from SDSS has a very big uh, gap uh, right around 100 days, and um, I will come back to this uh, with more uh, discussions later. So, how would uh, suboptimal, uh, uh, you know, uh, data quality qualities affect our science? Uh, I'm giving two examples. On the left, we see a CRTS like curves with relatively large error bars, and down here is the posterior distribution of our MCMCMC uh, chain. Uh, we can see uh, uh, with the la large error bars, we can easily get uh, bimodal distributions in the posterior. So uh, we have to apply certain cuts uh, to ensure that the result we get from uh, the fitting 
uh, can be trusted. On the other hand, uh, the figure on the right shows uh, the tau perturbed determined uh, using R and G uh, bands uh, alike curves independently. We see a large scatter. Uh, we believe uh, that is mostly because of the large gap, large gap you just see in the SCSS uh, cadence. In LSSST, uh, Deep Dream Field will really provide us the opportunity to explore the ground truth uh, to test different availability models, uh, in particular, uh, given uh, that it has uh, multi wavelength coverage, has uh, very deep uh, X ray coverage, and high cadence, uh, and all other uh, properties. And the uh, that deep, the large number will enable better categorization and uh, categorization and categorization of, of aging variability, uh, especially uh, help us better understand the correlation between continuum uh, variability and uh, the physical properties of AGN. So are we ready uh, to take on the LSD data yet? Uh, I think the answer is always no. Some aspects of the uh, uh, LSSD data are uh, well taken care of, for example, the photometry and the long, uh, deck along baseline, uh, but the cadence is still undefined yet, so uh, we're not sure if uh, we can get uh, enough epochs in the light curves. Uh, we're not sure how far the distribution of uh, observations is going to be uh, from a uniform uh, sampling in the log delta T space. Uh, in addition, I would say, uh, I really don't think we're ready to uh, model uh, 10 million light curves at this moment. Uh, we need uh, better and faster uh, fitting algorithms. Uh, lastly, uh, we still need uh, non-parametric light curve merging methods uh, so that when the uh, LSD data come out, we can combine LSD, LSD light curves with uh, other uh, surveys uh, to completely fill in the gap shown here. To better prepare us uh, for the LSD data, Gordon and I have proposed two activities within the variability subgroup of the collaboration. One is uh, preparing for, uh, uh, one is just building a data repository uh, for spectroscopically confirmed AGNs in the SRAP82 area. Uh, in addition to the static data, we'll focus on gathering data, uh, gathering light curves from uh, previous, and previous and current uh, time domain surveys. This will provide an opportunity to develop non parametric like current merging methods. Uh, in addition, another activity is uh, further our effort of karma modeling using uh, existing data. We are also looking at developing faster, more robust, efficient fitting algorithms so that uh, we can be ready uh, to uh, handle uh, 10 million electrodes when the LST started. In terms of metrics, uh, first is, is the number of epochs in each, uh, in each filter. 60 is at least uh, we want, uh, you know, hinders will be better. Uh, here shows the distribution of the number of visits across the uh, YFS deep survey in U, G, and I bands uh, from the baseline cadence. And personally, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about U and G bands, uh, but the rest of the filters uh, have uh, more than enough epochs. Uh, that we need. Another metric uh, is uh, equivalent, I call it uh, cadence equivalent list. This measures how uh, far uh, the cadence is uh, from uh, a uniform distribution in the locked out T space. Uh, what it does is measure the area of the gap and area taken by uh, the actual observations and take the ratio of the bows. Ideally, the smaller the ratio, the better, uh, uh, and the closer the cadence would be uh, to a uniform distribution. Some other uh, future works uh, in, we're considering are listed here uh, in the direction of uh, direct modeling include uh, apply uh, common models on uh, merge light curves. Uh, we would like to collaborate with, with uh, Sirius to test uh, and identify and test other stochastic models that we can uh, play with. Also apply machine learning, in particular recurrent neural networks to see how uh, the state of our uh, machine learning algorithm can, uh, can uh, uh, what insight it can bring to the table in terms of understanding aging variability. And here's my contact, uh, and thank you all for listening. 
Thanks, Wei Zhang. So we have some questions that have already come in. I think we have at least six here. So I'll just start going through these questions um, in order, I guess. Yes. So the first question that I see here asks, how, and this is from Matthew Graham, asks, how do you deal with Kozlowski's findings about underestimating karma parameters, which has been shown to get worse for higher order than DRW models? Um, I'm not very in particular sure that paper, uh, but I would believe uh, we can do a whole series of testing to see uh, uh, in what parameter space we can uh, we can better fit higher order karma models and uh, in what range of parameter space we wouldn't do as good as CRW, but uh, I think the the, um, the need to go to higher order is somewhat necessary uh, given the uh, you know discovery deviations from CRW. Okay, bye. Can I maybe comment on that? Um, well, well let, 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 let's, let's keep focused just with Wei Zhang for now. You, okay, you okay. Sure. so um, an, another one here, I'm just gonna go through, this is one from Pat, Pat Hall. Uh, Pat asks, if I followed correctly, you showed trends with physical parameters for the blue noise dominated AGNs. Are there any trends for the other population and are they the same or different? So sorry, I'm trying to follow. Oh, I'm happy to read it again. If, if, if you you can yeah, even I look at see. you can you can yeah. look at it and read if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm not in particular very sure about uh, the other population. Um, <laughs> oh, but for the overdamped cases, uh, I always say if if. So you can go back, if you have a chance, you can read the uh, Marino 2019 paper uh, more uh, in detail, uh, but the general idea is there's some competition between different physical mechanisms. There could be some, uh, you know, multiple uh, physical mechanisms that is driving the variability. So in the, sec in the lighter blue population, if the tau rise is uh, greater than tau perturb, basically it wouldn't, uh, it's not apparent uh, in the either the power step spectrum or in the structure function, uh, but I would say it's certainly worth to do the exploration. Uh, that, um, but we're not we're not seeing any apparent, I guess. Okay, Here, here's another question from Sebastian Honing. He asks, you mentioned that fitting is hard. I would imagine that the window function and or red noise leaking would cause artificial deviations from DRW. Have you tested how a pure DRW light curve with a realistic window function, several years baseline with seasons and cadencing and such, um, would, would come out? Uh, would it look like a damp harmonic oscillator because of these set effects? Um. Honestly, no, I haven't done that. So, but I would uh, certainly interested in testing. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, it seems like useful input. Okay. Um, I'll go to another one here from Maurizio Paolillo. He asks, um, is it true that sampling in log delta T samples is better than it? I'm sorry. Is Oh, it is true that sampling at log delta t interval samples better the overall structure function, but doesn't it make the uncertainties on each time scale worse since they are sampler sampled fewer times? But I, um, but the structural function we see are not uh, empirical structure functions. They are derived from the best fit parameters. I would believe if we get um, uh, uniform sampling in the log of t space, the log delta t space, we can get a better fitting of the underlying process, and then we derive um, the uh, the structure function and the power spectrum from the best fit parameters. Uh, this uh, is, I think, it's, it's it's a two different way, two different approach that uh, that we can take. Um, 
I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Um, here's another one from, from Ilsang Yoon asks, uh, you mentioned that the continuum variation is five to 50%. Can your damped harmonic oscillator model applied on SDSS data detect 5% variability? Um, I personally, I would think that it really depends on uh, the size of the error bar and some cadence. Um, I would say that there is possibility we can detect uh, 5% uh, variability uh, if the error bar and cadence are good enough. Uh, but we would have to explore if uh, any of the data in our current um, uh, uh, any of the light curve in our current data has has variability that is uh, smaller than five percent. I have okay. to check that. Okay. Uh, here's one from Paula Sanchez. Uh, she asks, "How fast is the computation of these Karma models? Can we run these models on all the AGNs and LSST?" Right. So I, I think uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, and also, there's something that I'm trying to work on to improve the feed. So if, if you're familiar with camera modeling, uh, the nominal method to do this is common filter and uh, MCMC. Uh, it started with uh, Brandon Kelly and then uh, we shall, uh, you know, did some other work to uh, dramatically improve the feed using uh, Intel and KL library. Uh, but it's too, too slow. Um, but now I'm trying to using um, Celerity. Uh, which is developed by Dan from Mackey, uh, that claimed to be 10 times faster than a uh, common filter. And if we can get a better, uh, so if we can get rid of that MCMC, uh, that will another, I don't know, a thousand factor uh, speed up, uh, then of course that will really re rely on how much we know about the, uh, the likelihood surface, how good we can just do it through simple optimization instead of MCMC. Um, if, if, if everything gets, like both the, uh, the, the uh, Gaussian process celerity works out and the uh, uh, optimization works out, I think uh, we, sh we should be able to handle all the AGN uh, in LSSD. Of course, we still need uh, more cores and uh, uh, to do that simultaneously. A single core wouldn't do it. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, here's another question from, from Evan Smith. It says, we had trouble getting Karma to run wanted to try it on RXTE light curves, which are very long baseline, high suitable to noise. I think this is more perhaps just a comment. I don't see a question in this. Um, basically saying he had challenges getting Karma to run. Perhaps you could have a email correspondence with him uh, offline. Um, and then I see right. that there's, so, yeah. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I feel free to reach out and then uh, I can share some of the tools that I'm using, but it's certainly not the faster version because if you enter development, uh, I can uh, I can give you some stable uh, version uh, uh, to share with you uh, that will uh, hopefully gonna be helpful. Okay, great. And then I think we need to start switching over, but there is one final question um, from from Matthew Graham. So perhaps you could stop sharing your screen now, and UA you, yeah, you sure. could you could start sharing your screen. But there, there's one more question from Matthew Graham again, um, asking, um, are you using published? Uh oh. Now it went away. Sorry, my bad. Uh, okay, um, let me try to find I'm, it here. I'm trying to answer that. Um, I'm sorry, now, now suddenly it's gone. He says, are you oh, using- Oh, here, here it is, I found End it. End of okay. demist, are, yeah. Yeah, are, are, are you using published CRTS data since this has an incorrect error model, see Graham at L 2017 for correction details. Have you made that correction or what's the situation with yeah, that? Yeah, we, we use the corrected data. Okay. So I guess that's in order. Feel free to correspond with Matthew Graham about that further as, as you think best. Okay, so I think we're good on the questions. And so thank, thank you very much, Wei Zhang. Um, we are now going to hear from Yue Shen, uh, who will be telling us about AGM broadline reverberation mapping with the SDSS5 black hole mapper in the era of LSST. Go ahead, Yue. Okay, hey, thank you, uh, Neil. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm Yue Shen. So I'll be talking about AGN broadline reverberation mapping uh, in Snow 5, uh, but first I will give you some background information about the science. And I will also briefly describe a 
Pathfinder program uh, in the previous generations of SDSS uh, for uh, river region mapping. And then I will go on to talk about the black hole mapper uh, and its relevance to the LCSST. All right, so first let me give some context. Uh, so this schematic on the right shows uh, the structure of a quasar or an actively accreting supermassive black hole. Now, uh, the reverberation mapping concerns the inner regions of AGN or quasars, and those are the structures uh, that are deep within the sphere of inference of the supermassive black hole. Now, the spatial scales of those inner regions, including the X-ray corona, the accretion disk, the border region, and the torus, uh, they are too small to be directly resolvable. But fortunately, the accretion disk, broadline region, and the torus, uh, they all respond to uh, some sort of driving variability uh, from, say, the uh, innermost part of the accretion disk, uh, possibly the X-ray corona as well, on time scales of uh, light crossing. And this light crossing time uh, is much shorter uh, on uh, hours to days to years time scales. Uh, and interesting, even for the most uh, distant bound structure, the dusty torus, this time scale is on PhD time scales. So that means uh, we can hopefully study these regions uh, with variability uh, uh, experiments uh, within uh, a reasonable amount of time. Now, given this light crossing time, uh, it gives you the typical distance of this region to the central engine. So it measures a typical size of that region. And then uh, if you also have uh, velocity information, say from the broader region, uh, the Doppler broad and broad emission lines, uh, you can further infer the kinematics of the broad and region. So this technique, uh, generally called the revolution mapping technique uh, and colloquially called the uh, echo mapping technique uh, is a powerful method that we use to study the small scale structures of AGN quasars without the requirement of resolving those structures directly. <clears throat> okay, so let me get into a little bit of technical details of how reverberation mapping works uh, in practice. And here I'm gonna, and from now on, I'm gonna focus in on the reverberation mapping of the broad end region, okay? Uh, so uh, how this technique works in practice is that you measure two sets of light curves one from the, uh, the driving continuum, say from the accretion disk, and the other set from the responding light curve from the broad emission lines. Uh, that's typically measured from spectroscopy. And by eye, you can kind of see that in this particular object at Mark 335, there is a obvious delay between the two sets of light curves, and that delay measures the average uh, distance of the broad and region clouds to the uh, inner part of the accretion disk that's producing that driving uh, variability light -like curve. So uh, this schematic here on the top just show a very uh, naive uh, structure of the broader region, uh, which is used as ring. And uh, different parts of that uh, broader region will have different time delays. Some will have zero delay if it's along the line of sight, and some will have maximum delay if it's on the opposite side of that uh, accretion disk. But uh, the average delay here you measure uh, represents the average distance of the broadline clouds towards the uh, center of that black hole. So once you get that time delay, you get the average size of the broadline region. And then the next thing you can do is to derive a mass, a virial mass of this supermassive black hole uh, using the line widths, the weights of the broad emission lines. Okay? And this is just assume that the broader line clouds are uh, virialized in the gravitational potential of the black hole. And here, uh, R is measured from uh, the reverberation mapping lag, and delta B is the weight of the broader line, and F here is just a uh, constant to account for our ignorance about the exact geometry and kinematics of the broader region. So the important thing to note is that this is the primary method we use to measure black hole mass in AGN and quasars, or at redshift greater than 0.3, where the sphere of inference of the black hole is simply too small to be resolved uh, with uh, direct uh, spectroscopy, uh, spatially resolved spectroscopy or imaging. 
So uh, what we have uh, from previous uh, traditional regression mapping experiments, uh, so this is a summary of uh, what we already have uh, from decades of uh, IM uh, programs on the uh, low redshift AGN population. So uh, we have about 60 uh, objects. Uh, most are local AGN, low luminosity AGN, and some are PG quasars at redshift below 0.5. Uh, for which we have reliable revolution mapping lags. Uh, most of them are H beta lags. And one of the most striking results from this local revolution mapping experiments uh, is the discovery of a pretty tight correlation between the broader region size measured from lag and the luminosity of the AGN as shown in this plot on the right. <laughs> So uh, this is really the holy grail of local IM results because with this tight correlation, now you can convert it and estimate a expected and expected broad energy size based on the luminosity of that AGM, okay? And therefore, uh, you can apply this to uh, the so-called single epoch of field black hole mass estimates, where you just measure a luminosity from a single epoch spectrum and then infer a broader region, broader line region size, and then infer a, uh, a black hole mass based on the uh, this uh, regression based on the broader region size and also the broader line width measured from single epoch spectrum. <clears throat> Some people also argue that uh, given the tightness of this I relation, uh, it can potentially be used as a cosmological probe to uh, measure uh, luminosity distances. Uh, for distant agent, which are constantly variable. Uh, and if you measure a lag, then you can use this relation to infer the actual luminosity. So this R relation uh, has only been established for about 40 local agents. Not all of the 16 agent or uh, quasars are used in this calibration of this R relation from beds at all. And this relation is only established for the uh, H beta lags. The question is, can we extrapolate these local IMA results to the uh, other populations of quasars at high redshift and also high luminosity? Before I answer this question, I would like you to show you this plot on the right. So here, these blue points are the uh, population of local reverberation mapping agent, and these contours are the distribution of the general quasar population <clears throat> at low redshift on the left and at high redshift on the right from the SDSS. And the red and black uh, counters just represent for the radio loud and radio quiet population. You don't have to know what's actually product here to see that the distributions of the local IM sample uh, are markedly different from the general quasar population. And therefore, this means any extrapolation to the uncharted primary space of quasars at high L and high Z uh, from these local IM results are somewhat dangerous. <clears throat> and finally, I just want to mention that uh, the I relation has only been established for H beta, and we really don't know uh, if uh, there exists any correlation uh, for the magnesium two line or for the carbon four line. And that's something that we really need to test with larger samples of uh, IM quasars or AGM. So the solution to this, uh, many of these problems is to expand this IM sample and to extend the uh, range. Uh, to do so, we really need much more efficient regression mapping uh, because it takes a long time to compile this uh, previous sample of uh, 60 or 80 uh, IM AGN uh, in the local universe. Uh, then that takes more than uh, several decades of time. So the uh, uh, enter uh, MOS IM, uh, the regression mapping with multi-object spectroscopy, where we simultaneously target or monitor hundreds or more quasars uh, at the same time with spectroscopy, taking advantage of wide field view uh, and the uh, multiplexity of modern images and spectrographs. So at the end of the day, what we envision to do is to populate the uh, uh, quasars with revision mapping lags uh, in the redshift space and the uh, observed lag space in here where uh, this green point shows a flux limit quasar sample, and this uh, colored triangles shows what we hopefully uh, will detect uh, with an MOS IM program. And compared to this local IM agent sample, you see how much we have expanded the redshift range and also luminosity range 
uh, with these most IM programs. Now, the problem here is that most IM, uh, the success rate of lag detection in any most IM program uh, isn't 100%. It is much lower than uh, typical traditional uh, single object reverberation mapping. And this uh, uh, explains why we had uh, far fewer uh, kind of points on top of this uh, general population of three points. And this is exactly why we need the most iron because by targeting hundreds or more quasars at the same time, uh, we can tolerate uh, the uh, low success rate. With single, e single object iron uh, exercise, uh, then uh, this will be very inefficient because you can't afford to lose more than half of the objects without a lag detection after you spend uh, five years in the monitor. So here I provide a summary of current and upcoming MOS IM programs. The green uh, indicated programs that are ongoing or near completion, and the red indicates uh, pro programs that are upcoming. And of uh, particular relevance here, is uh, these are these two programs, the BHI, BHM IM and the TITE IM, uh, which uh, Sebastian is going to talk about uh, very soon. Uh, in the next few years, uh, that will coincide with LSST uh, to uh, piggyback on the LSST like curves. Um, and also in the, in the future, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, we will have a much larger telescope to do. Uh, more precise and more accurate uh, reversion mapping with small facilities. And that's something in plan. All right, so let me uh, say a few words about this past fine program uh, we have been doing for a few years uh, in zone three and zone four. Uh, it's called SDSS IM. Um, and the, uh, the basic idea is we have a single seven square degree field which we monitor from APO uh, with a cadence, spectroscopic cadence of about uh, ranging from four days in the first year and then to uh, bi-weekly cadence uh, in the next three years and also a monthly cadence in the last three years. Unfortunately, it was cut short due this year uh, in the last season due to the uh, uh, COVID-19 situation. And we're really piggybacking on Zone 3 and Zone 4. So thanks to the Zone collaboration uh, to uh, give us this, uh, this time uh, to do this ancillary program. Now, in terms of the uh, uh, photometry, uh, which we use to sample the, uh, uh, the continuum variations, we have acquired uh, uh, photometric light curves from the CFHT and the Bog telescope uh, from Stowood Observatories. And we also have, we choose a field so, uh, to coincide with a 10 star medium D field, which already has three years or four years of high cadence uh, uh, imaging light curves from uh, 10 stars one during 2010 to 2013. So the total uh, photometric baseline is 11 years if you uh, add in the 10 stars light curves and also seven years for the spectroscopic baseline. So it really pre represents a a good data set to evaluate the uh, feasibility uh, and potential of a MOSAM uh, program. Okay, so what do we got? Uh, so before we started this program, we were a little bit nervous because we didn't know what we uh, will ex would expect. And now I'm much more confident that MOSAM works. So uh, uh, analysis on a uh, subset of our uh, data, uh, uh, which one year and also four years uh, uh, data, uh, already led to uh, lag measurements for uh, some about 150 quasars uh, with lags that cover all three major broad emission lines from low redshift in edge beta to intermediate redshift with magnesium two and to high redshift with carbon four. And we expect to have more lags from our uh, final data set. So on the right, I just show you the uh, redshift uh, distribution of the uh, SDSM lags uh, measured for uh, the H beta lags and also the carbon four lags from uh, uh, Gray et al. 2017 and 2019. Uh, so the most important thing here to note is that uh, we really expand with SSM, we really expanded the redshift regime of uh, reverberation mapping, reverberation mapped uh, AGN quasars to uh, redshift as high as redshift three. Uh, and also demonstrate that carbon four uh, does reverberate at high redshift. Uh, so uh, potentially we can use those results to measure 
right? Whole masses uh, occur the peak of quasi activity around ratio two or three. So here is a typical example of a good lag detection from our uh, carbon four sample. Uh, and this is a ratio of 1.75, uh, the continuum light curve and the carbon four emission line light curve on uh, top and bottom panels. Now you can see that there is obviously a delay in the carbon four response to the continuum light curves, but there's certainly room to improve the quality of the data. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we could use a little bit more densely sample light curves, and we can use uh, better photometry, uh, which will, will automatically be given from the LSST light curves. So, uh, but this really demonstrates that this thing, this uh, multi, uh, this most arm uh, uh, exercise uh, really works, uh, and now it's the time to uh, 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 to embark on a more ambitious program. All right, so I'm good on time. So I think I would like to uh, advertise a few highlighted science cases or science results from the SDSIM pilot program. So one of the most striking things we found from our project is that uh, uh, on the R relation, when we compile our H beta lags and cross them against the luminosity, we see a systematic offset from the R relation derived from the local IM results. Now, at the first glance, you might not be that surprised because I already showed you that the distribution in quasar parameter space is different for the local IM IGN and also for the general uh, quasar population targeted in the SDS IM program. And the uh, difference in this diagram is, uh, I'll just give you the answer, is the Eddington ratio, uh, the equation rate normalized by the Eddington units of the quasar. And the, uh, our targets have on average a higher adding ratio than the local IM AGN. And we see a systematic offset from the I relation, uh, such as that the lags are shorter compared to the predicted lags from the clinical I relation based on the local results. And uh, independently, uh, the work done by Do It All uh, with their uh, program, uh, they are targeting uh, low redshift local agent but with high antigen ratios uh, uh, a subset of, of the local agent population and they also find uh, a somewhat si a similar systematic offset from the local connectical I relation. So that is telling you that well, don't panic yet uh, there is some trouble in the I relation but that doesn't mean the I relation doesn't exist it just means that we need um, additional parameters equation parameters uh, to figure out uh, what determines the broader unit size uh, sort of go beyond a single parameter, the optical luminosity that has been uh, used almost universally in determining the eye relation. Uh, another interesting finding from our study is that uh, when luminosity increases in individual quasars, you see the broader weights of the object actually decreases. And this is known as the broader region breathing effect. Uh, and uh, uh, my student, Shu Wang, is writing a paper uh, to submit very soon. Uh, and spoiler alert, not all lines have the same breathing effect. And in fact, some lines don't have breathing effect and some lines have anti-breathing effects. Okay, so watch out for that paper. All right, so uh, in light of time, I'm gonna speak, skip this slide for other uh, interesting science uh, outcomes. You have about two minutes, and, Yue. But, uh, Yes, and the black hole matter. Apologies for uh, for my daughter. Uh, so Snow Five in a nutshell, it is an all sky multi epoch and optical plus near infrared spectroscopic survey, and it features three components which we call mappers. So the Milky Way mapper and the local volume mapper, they are both concerning the uh, astrophysics of the Milky Way galaxy, but the black hole mapper uh, is really at my heart of uh, interest is to study the growth of supermassive black holes. Now, let's talk about the black hole mapper. So the black hole mapper also uh, has three science pillars. Uh, uh, we'll do reverberation mapping. We're gonna monitor uh, more than 1,000 quasars to measure the time delay between the continuum variability and borderline response to measure black hole masses. And then we have this few epoch spectroscopic program for 25,000 quasars to uh, explore uh, variability, spectral variability over time scales of days to 
uh, decades when you compare uh, when you compare with uh, earlier uh, spectroscopy from say 20 years ago. And this way we are probing the dynamical time scale of the broader region and you can see how the broader line emission profile can change over multiple years and we can also find spectral transitions uh, over such long time scales. And last but not least, we have a Eurocita X-ray follow-up program to provide optical uh, spectroscopy for about 300,000 X-ray detections from Eurozeta. Most of them are AGN and KIC clusters. So for those of you uh, who uh, don't know about this, Eurozeta was launched last year, and this is a first image uh, uh, from Eurozeta for, from a mini survey. Uh, we have a lot of X-ray sources in here, and now let's put some optical fibers to get some redshifts. All right, uh, so uh, uh, VHM RM, so uh, it will improve upon the Pathfind SDSIM program. We're gonna get more epochs, we're gonna get more targets, and we'll measure better lags. So we feature uh, a tiered spectroscopic cadence from very dense sampling from two to three nights to a uh, rolling uh, monthly cadence over a period of five years. And we are already preparing our early photometric light curves to effectively stretch the uh, time baseline. And of course, we're gonna use the LSST deep geo fields to uh, use the high quality photometric light curves from the LSST DDFs. So three of our uh, chosen uh, VHM ion fields uh, coincide away with uh, LSST deep geo fields. And then we have this uh, continuation of the SDS ion field, and also uh, the last field is a sudden CV, the continuous building zone field, which is along the uh, uh, south ecliptic pole. And uh, I really like this field because this is a field that's going to coincide with uh, the uh, EOC continuous building zone, uh, which will provide daily X ray monitoring uh, throughout the entire mission duration of EOC. So I, I foresee a lot of uh, uh, X-ray and optical spectroscopic synergy uh, in that sudden CV zone. So uh, this is my last slide uh, to summarize and put up some discussion items here. I want to read the entire thing. Uh, well, I would just say a few things that uh, in terms of uh, synergy with LSST, most IM for borderline revolution mapping uh, is not as stringent as the requirements for other uh, AGN uh, science. The planned DDF cadence depths and filter combinations are sufficient for most IM, but we do require the long sub duration to maximize IM size. And also I should say that we would prefer a more or less uniform sampling from the LSST DDF because some of these most IM programs happens later and some of them happens earlier. So it'll be weird if LSST is starting rolling cadence from high cadence to low cadence, while the other late IM programs start to kick in to take a spectroscopic monitor, okay? And finally, I just want to say that uh, there is a lot needed for community shared resources and expertise. Uh, we're gonna coordinate a lot of our upcoming projects, uh, hopefully, uh, and I just gave one example here. And also I encourage people to make their software public. And I list a few good examples here uh, which have been used uh, 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 extensively in our own projects. So I will stop here and thank you for uh, listening. Okay, thank you, Yue. Um, if any people have questions, please put them in the, the box now. Um, we have one question already. There's a question or perhaps a comment from Swayam Panda says, the, ju just a comment, the aspect of offset in the RL relation has been particularly, I think, studied in this paper accounting for the accretion rate as a primary correction parameter to push back those high accreting sources back into the standard RL relation. And he gives a link to a paper, which I'm trying to look at now. <clears throat> I believe uh, it's yes, a paper I, by the Polish yes. group. Uh, yes, okay. Thanks, yes, I'm aware of uh, this paper and uh, relevant pa other papers, and I think it is really, starting to uh, motivate the, uh, the field to think about additional parameters uh, to put in to uh, standardize the R relation. All right, here's another question from Il Sang Yu. It, it asks, he asks, um, I can imagine LSST will observe continuous time variation, sometimes small or sometimes large. 
will the time lag between continuum and broadline always be the same for every variation event? Well, this is a good question. Uh, and uh, we do expect if the time baseline is long enough, uh, say longer than the dynamical time scale of the broadline region, which is uh, typically a few years, then you might expect the, uh, the size of the broadline region will change dramatically, uh, sort of beyond the typical breathing effect. Uh, this is why when you have a long baseline spectroscopic monitoring and uh, LCST photometric monitoring, you can split your, your, result, uh, your campaign into uh, seasons and see how the average lag measured from each season uh, will change depending on the luminosity state uh, of that particular object. So really with very long duration of baseline of the monitoring, you get to answer and observe those uh, uh, complications. Okay. And I, I know your talk today was focused on the, the broadline region reverberation, but of course there's people who are interested in our, our group on the, the disk reverberation as well. And um, can you comment on any suggestions one would want yeah, in terms of observing strategy to do continued reverberation mapping in the LSSED drilling fields? Clearly you want dense sampling, but further thoughts, any, any further thoughts? Uh, absolutely. So I think the requirements uh, from SST for the disk reverberation mapping are uh, much more stringent. Uh, uh, and also, if you really want to get down to the uh, uh, short time scale variability of quasar general air variability, you also want this high cadence sampling. So the typical time delay uh, from the equation disk is on the order of day, uh, a few days. Uh, well, the redshift effect, when plus the dilation can help you, but uh, you're still looking at uh, a few days or less than a few days. Uh, so the DDT, uh, the DD phi F, uh, like the cadence is really on the two day order, uh, cadence is uh, 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 really a necessity uh, to do good uh, disk reverberation mapping. Uh, and something that will help is that if you have uh, sort of multi, multiple bands, uh, GRIZ, uh, sort of uh, fill in the uh, kind of rotating to feel the, uh, uh, the cadence to be more or less more homogeneous, it will actually help you uh, to get the disk lags out of it. So it doesn't require that the bands to be observed on the same night. It's actually better to offset them by half a night or even one, one night. Uh, because what you're really measuring is the difference, the time delay between those multiple bands. Right. So those cadence, uh, those filter cadence uh, combinations uh, will actually help uh, with uh, this career version map, in my, in my opinion. Okay, so there, we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, <clears throat> I think two questions are highly related. Robert Nakuta asks, sorry if I missed this, but are you considering other MOS experiments as well? For example, DESI, MSE, and so on. And Paulo Kopi has a very related question, will DESI be doing reverberation mapping studies too? And if so, to what extent will it be important in the next few years? Uh, thanks. So DESI will not be doing uh, a multi-object reverberation mapping as far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm aware of. Uh, MSE uh, will do a reversion mapping uh, program. Uh, in fact, uh, this is one of the uh, defined reference survey surveys in MSE. Uh, but the time scale of MSC is much, much longer. Uh, the first slide is 2029. Uh, and by then we already lost uh, most of SST. Of course, SST, the telescope is still there. So we uh, use it for future. So yes, uh, not for DESI, but definitely for MSC. Okay. And one final question, and I think you should probably stop sharing your screen so we can have uh, Andy um, start sharing his screen. Oh, now there's two, I guess, but let's just, there's one here from Maurizio Palolillo. What about ensemble rather than individual object reverberation measurements? Uh, very good question. So uh, a lot of, of our light curve data are, uh, are very noisy. And uh, if you co-add the uh, correlation function, uh, you are hopeful to detect an average lag. So that's the kind of ensemble or composite R measurements. There have been a couple of papers out uh, and we also had our, one of our papers and I uh, recommend to uh, that paper uh, to see what we can recover. The point is, yes, uh, if you don't detect individually and hopefully by coerting the correlation functions, you can detect a statistical composite signal. Okay. Very good. 
Great. Okay, so I think that's all the time we have for questions, but I will mention UA. There's another question by Dev Sadalula um, in the question window. Perhaps you could just type an answer to that one. All right, I will type an okay. answer here while Thanks. we move on to the next. Great. Thank you. Okay, so let, let's um, move to the next talk now. So now we are gonna hear from Andy Robinson, who is going to tell us about AG and dust reverberation mapping in the LSST era. Hello, everybody. Um, this topic may seem a little odd, given that it deals with infrared dust emission, and LSST is uh, essentially a, an optical survey. But nevertheless, I think uh, there are ways that LSST can enable dust reverberation mapping science. Uh, so I'll argue that it's at least worth considering in the LSST context. And uh, Triana Almeida um, has led the work on dust reverberation simulations that I'll talk a little bit about later on. So um, by its nature, this talk is going to be a little bit more general than many of the others we've heard over the last, last two or three days. Um, I'm going to start with a, a general overview of what we know about the AGN torus, and I put that word in, in, in quotes because I'm using it really as a convenient term for the generally axisymmetric dust distribution that the observations seem to require exist in AGN. Um, then I'll move on to talk a little bit about uh, dust reverberation mapping and what we can learn from that in terms of the science. And uh, finally, I'll, um, I'll discuss how LSST can potentially enable dust reverberation mapping science. So here's the picture that we're all very familiar with. Um, we have this dusty donut shaped um, torus of molecular gas and dust, and it encloses the central engine, the black hole, the, the, the accretion disk, the broad line region. Outside of it, we have the narrow line region, gas that's photoionized by ionizing radiation escaping from the, uh, the uh, funnel of the torus, which has an opening angle theta C. So when we see these systems within the opening angle, um, they appear as type one AGN, broadline AGN. When we see them outside the opening angle, they appear as theta twos. And the obscured fraction, that is the ratio of uh, narrow line AGN, so the total in this simplest picture just goes as the cosine of the, the opening angle. The, Torus dust absorbs radiation, the optical UV radiation from the accretion disk and re-emits it from the infrared. So it contributes a significant fraction of the AGN's bolometric luminosity. Uh, as we can see in this uh, plot of the uh, median AGN spectral energy distribution uh, compiled by Chang et al. Uh, so the infrared to optical UV region of the spectral energy distribution is dominated by two bumps, the big blue bump, which is associated with the accretion disk emission, and a bump in the infrared, which is the torus dust emission. If you look at the infrared spectral energy distribution in a bit more detail, as in this block from Hone et al., um, you can often see two bumps, actually, one peaking at around 20 to 30 microns, and one in the near infrared, and I'll come back to that later on. So the size scale of the torus is set by the dust sublimation radius. That is the radius at which uh, the dust temperature is high enough that it, it is destroyed by sublimation, dust grains exposed to the UV optical radiation field. Um, um, and the expression that I'm showing here is um, is for um, an average interstellar medium grain mixture, but it should be noted that the dust sublimation temperature actually depends on the dust grain composition, uh, grain size, and gas density. Uh, it scales with the square root of the, the AGN luminosity, and in general, you'd also expect the sublimation radius to be a function of polar angle uh, because the torus the dust is illuminated anisotropically uh, by, by a thin accretion disk. So the scaling with luminosity um, leads to the idea of a receding torus. Um, so if the torus scale height is constant, but the 
the inner radius given by the sublimation radius increases with luminosity, you expect the opening angle to increase from low to high luminosity AGN, which means that the obscured fraction should decrease as the luminosity goes up. The uh, scaling of luminosity appears to be confirmed by observations. Um, just as with the broadline region, there is a radius luminosity relationship. So the dust um, radius, as determined both by K band reverberation mapping and interferometry, scales to the square root of the luminosity. We see that in this plot from Kashida et al. We're plotting the log of the radius versus um, B band luminosity. The red dots are um, torus radii determined from K band radi radi uh, reverberation mapping. Uh, the, the squares are from interferometry, and also we have. Uh, the blue crosses rep uh, represent the radii determined from H beta reverberation mapping. So this is the broadline reverberation radius. And we can see that, as you would expect, the, um, the torus radii lie above the trend for the, the broadline region. So the torus, as you'd expect, encloses the broadline region. Uh, but it's also worth pointing out that these points fall below the theoretical line for dust sublimation for the interstellar medium grain mixture by a factor of two to three. The green dots here um, represent radii derived from SED fitting of the hot graphite dust of a hot graphite dust component that's thought to account for the near infrared bump or excess. So um, the discrepancy between the theoretical ISM dust sublimation radius and the observed reverberation mapping radii uh, can be explained in terms of um, a bit of differences in the dust sublimation temperature depending on the grain composition. Uh, so these plots from Baskin and Lowell show that the sublimation temperature differs substantially between graphite and silicate grains. So this is sublimation temperature plotted against the local gas density and um, the sublimation temperature and therefore radius also depends on grain size. So larger grains um, can survive closer in as can graphite grains. So in general, we shouldn't think about a single sublimation radius, but rather a sublimation zone within which the dust composition changes from uh, large graphite grains in the innermost regions to a more maybe ISM-like mixture of graphite and silicate with a wider size range in the body of the torus itself. Near-infrared inter near interferometry observations um, also support the idea that there is a, a, a hot dust in a region. Uh, so uh, this slide shows some results from a recent paper, in the uh, Gravity Collaboration. Um, the panel on the left is a reconstructed image from the interferometry observations, which shows uh, what's interpreted as a, a thin disk of, um, of hot dust, uh, which is, appears to be associated with, with uh, the, the water mazes that are also observed in the nucleus of NGC 1068. And the schematic model uh, that is that they uh, use to interpret these observations is that of a thin ring of hot dust surrounded by maser clouds. And the whole thing is enclosed by a, um, a more inflated disk of molecular gas, which is actually um, seen in ALMA observations in HCN and HCO plus uh, with the high velocity dispersion. So this would be the um, identi identified with a conventional obscuring torus. ALMA observations also show that there is a bipolar outflow observed in CO, which has a scale of about 10 parsecs. And in fact, this polar dust um, is also found in mid-infrared -inter interfer interferometry observations, uh, which have shown a, uh, that a substantial fraction of the mid-infrared flux originates in a elongated polar structures which have scales on the order of a parsec, but are also commonly seen at larger scales in single distance imaging. 
Um, and these things are aligned with the, uh, the radial axis or the ionization cone axis, so the system at the AGN. And as you can see from this plot from Hernig et al, um, modeling suggests that the polar dust extended emission actually accounts for a substantial fraction of the mid infrared. It actually dominates the mid infrared information. <clears throat> so over the last few years, we uh, arrived at what we can hopefully say is a more complete picture of the, um, the dust distribution around AGN, uh, which actually involves multiple, comp multiple components of emission obscuration. So there is a thin disk-like obscuring structure which identifies the classical torus, but also a more extended polar dust component, which it's been suggested is a bipolar wind. And in detail, in the inner regions, there is this component of hot dust, which may be associated with dusty broadline region clouds. So moving on to reverberation mapping, I, I won't go into this in detail because Yue Shen gave a very nice explanation in the context of the broadline region. The basic principle is the same, so that, um, but in this case, light from the accretion disk is absorbed by dust in the torus. And because of light travel delays, there is an echo. So the, uh, the response in the infrared, the repressed processed infrared is delayed compared with um, variations in the optical. Uh, and that echo contains information about the size, structure, and illumination of the torus, which is encoded in a transfer function the convolution of which with the driving optical light, the light curve gives the infrared light curve. And by cross-correlating the optical and infrared light curves, you can determine the delay, the lag, which measures the effective radius of the torus. Uh, so what can you do uh, with dust reverberation mapping lags? Well, one thing is uh, you can use them as cosmological probes because of the tight radius luminosity relation, AGN dust lag provide a standard candle. You see in this plot from Hennig et al. 2017, so you can construct a, uh, a dust lag Hubble diagram which you can use to constrain cosmological parameters. There is already a large time domain campaign in progress uh, to, to do this, led by Seb Hennig and uh, Triana Olmeda is also working on this, so I won't say any more about that. Um, instead, um, I want to talk about um, how you can extract more information than just the size scale from, um, uh, from dust reverberation mapping. So as I mentioned, the, um, the transfer function depends on various properties of the torus, its geometrical structure, orientation, whether or not it's illuminated isotropically or anisotropically, and the dust com composition and distribution. Uh, so to investigate this, um, Triana and I developed a, a dust reverberation simulation code. Um, and here are some model response functions from that. Uh, so uh, showing the dependence of uh, what we call the response function, that is a response to a, um, a short continuum pulse um, as a function of various parameters, the inclination of the torus, the, um, whether the clouds are centrally constant concentrated or more evenly dis distributed or whether the illumination is isotropic or anisotropic. So the hope is that by um, generating libraries of um, model light curves and fitting them to observed light curves, we can constrain some of these parameters. But to do that, we're going to require well-sampled driving light curves, that is the optical, and response light curves, that is the infrared, uh, covering a time baseline, which is at least of order of the torus light crossing time. Uh, I also note that although the models we just looked at uh, were for a, uh, a wedge-shaped torus, uh, the bipolar wind that is seen in many infrared interferometry observations should itself have a distinctive response signature in particular, you'd expect a double peak response at angles uh, less than about 45 degrees. But we need to do more modeling to understand properly the, uh, the details. 
So here are some of the questions that you might be able to address with um, torus reverberation mapping or dust reverberation mapping, I should say. So what is the covering fraction um, or the torus opening angle equivalently? How does it evolve with uh, AGL luminosity or redshift? Uh, what is the nature of this hot dust component or the more generally the, the interface between the broadline region and the torus? How prevalent are these dusty polar winds? And how do they contribute to the reverberation response? And what are the effects of large luminosity variations? So Rachel Webster talked about changing look AGN uh, yesterday. Um, if there is a, a large change in the luminosity, then you'd expect the dust sublimation radius to, to increase. So the inner radius will recede. And that could leave behind a, a cavity which is actually larger than the current um, dust sublimation radius after the, uh, the, uh, the um, luminosity returns to a lower level. And I just want to show quickly an example of uh, this, this kind of thing happening. Uh, so these are light curves from a spectrum optical monitoring campaign. Uh, and what this, for, this is um, NGC 64418 is, is a rather nondescript or was a rather nondescript um, secret 1.9. So the black points show the optical, the blue and red points show the 3.6 and 4.5 micron light curves from Spitzer. We observed over two cycles with a three day cadence in cycle eight and a 30 day cadence in cycle nine. And you can see that there were a couple of bumps um, in cycle eight, but then a large factor of two ish flare in both the optical and the infrared with the infrared lagging as you'd expect behind the optical. Uh, the optical spectra also changed. So this is the, um, an SDS set spectrum which was taken about a decade prior to the start of the monitoring campaign and as I said it's a secret 1.9 heavily reddens. You can barely see HB for at all. H alpha is weak. Um, a spectrum obtained um, not long after the flare uh, now shows what looks like a fairly typical safe at one with um, essentially no extinction. Moreover, cross correlation analysis of the cycle eight and cycle nine data show that the, the, the lag increased from 33 days, the 3.6 micron lag increased from 33 days to 47 days, which uh, corresponds to the uh, square root of luminosity scaling. So the, um, the inner radius of the torus appears to have um, increased in response to the square and the optical spectra indicate that the extinction for broadline region also decreased to essentially zero in that object. So let me move on to talk in the last few minutes about uh, reverberation mapping with LSST. Uh, so LSST is going to provide well sampled multiband optical light curves, but also um, there will be observations in the Y band. Uh, so this will probe the hottest dust in low redshift AGN, and we essentially get it for free. Uh, so this is the Y band uh, plotted on a, um, a, a, a Taurus SED model taken from Seth Honig's um, Cat3D um, model, model library. Um, so although we're not at the peak of the, uh, the, the torus dust distribution, we, we can sample the hottest dust, although we will have to account for the accretion of this contribution. Um, so um, in addition to LSST Y-band, you could do similar things with, uh, in principle, with Euclid by combining LSST data with Euclid and W first. Um, which are also near infrared emissions and will sample the oldest dust at the redshifts. Uh, so are there any synergies? Well, um, not really with Euclid, it seems. The, uh, there is a, um, the Fornax deep survey field in Euclid overlaps with the LSST uh, CDF South deep drilling field, but the proposed cadence um, is not going to be really suitable for reverber reverberation mapping. So what about the Roman Space Telescope? Um, well, there, there is a, a supernova survey uh, plans um, in fields possibly centered on the north or south ecliptic poles, and the south ecliptic poles will be covered by the, uh, the wide 
our steep survey. Um, so that's a possibility, but also it may be possible to um, apply for a dedicated program since geo programs would be allocated 25% of the time. So, um, but if you want to probe the torus or wind spatial structure or study samples covering wide range in, ranges in the uh, AGN luminosity or redshift, shift or, or do infrared follow up of changing look AGN, then we need to sample wider ranges of wavelengths. Uh, so the possibilities are it here include JWST, but that's probably going to be too expensive. There are various ground-based near infrared facilities, but perhaps the most interesting po prospect is the, uh, the Tokyo Atacama Observatory, which is on a peak near Ulma, and that's, gonna be a, it, that's under construction now. It's a 6.5 meter telescope, telescope, and it will have both near infrared and mid infrared. Uh, capabilities with the first science operations um, expected to, um, to be in about two years' time. Uh, so we were asked to talk about um, metrics. Uh, so broadly speaking, um, what you would require to do uh, just reverberation mappings is, is pretty similar to what you need to do um, Photometric broadline reverberation mapping, or, or in general, um, other kinds of light curve studies that have been discussed over the last few days. Uh, so, broadly speaking, we want well sampled optical and wide band light curves, but really important for this is the longest possible base time baselines, even more important than for the broadline region, because the um, uh, dust lags, at least from what we know in the K band, uh, are typically four to five times the. Um, the lags that you get from um, H beta in the broadband region. Uh, so there are two possibilities for deep drilling fields, the cadence, duration, and so on, as proposed, are, are pretty much exactly uh, what we would need to do wideband just reverberation mapping. As I said, you, you get that more or less for free. Uh, the, wide, the, the WFD survey, um, well, the average cadence in the, in the wide fields would limit wide band hot dust reverberation mapping, uh, but the combined all filter for five day average case agents should be at, at adequate for optical light curves um, that can be combined with infrared data from other facilities. And um, I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, we do have a number of questions that have come in. Um, one of them is from Ilsang Yoon asks, uh, can dust reverberation mapping constrain the outer radius of the torus as well if modeling the infrared emission using a certain form of density distribution? And Seb has already posted some of his thoughts on the matter, but uh, perhaps you'd like to add anything you have to say. Uh, so in the, the parameter study that we did with the uh, simulation code, um, the, the ratio of the outer radius to sublimation radius is one of the parameters that um, the models at least are most sensitive to. Uh, so although I'd agree with said comments, the outer radius is difficult to define in terms of the model parameter that, um, that defines that, um, that's something that we might be able to determine from the, uh, by modeling the light curves. And then we have another question here. This one from Seb asks regarding that, that nice example you showed of NGC 6418. Did the inner radius physically increase or could it be just that the dust further away from the AG and got hotter and contributed more to the 3.6 micron flux due to the flux depending on the temperature to the fourth power? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't really have a, a definitive answer, but um, one thing that we, we can say from the, the optical spectra is, is that the, the extinction in front of the broadline region, which may or may not be related to the torus dust, disappeared. So there does appear to have been some dis dust destruction. Um, we haven't yet modeled this in detail. And one of the, um, although I, I, I said that um, the increase in the radius actually conforms to the 
the square root of L um, scaling, um, we we believe that the the actual although the the um, the observed luminosity increase in the in the uh, the optical is a factor of two x. Uh, that doesn't account for the contribution from the host galaxy, the constant host galaxy. So, in fact, it must have been larger, but we're still working on determining how much larger. Okay. And then here's, here, here's another one from Larry Keese asked, can you expand regarding the difference in cadence between vehicles? Not sure what he, what he meant by vehicles there, but... Um, uh, it, Larry, that Larry, if, to be the Spitzer, the Spitzer observations? Telescopes, saw? between telescopes, okay. Oh. Um, you clarify, okay. In, be, between telescopes, okay. Um, right, so, um, in t I'm, so I'm not sure exactly which telescopes um, are being referred to here. Uh, so, in the case of um, surveys, uh, so for, ex for example, the synergies with Euclid and W first, um, the difference between, I mean, we don't, we, we have a, the, the LSST cadences are still being defined, but um, the, um, AGN science proposal is calling for a two-day cadence um, in the deep drilling fields. Um, if we were to um, successfully obtain um, time allocations to do monitoring at infrared facilities, uh, then we wouldn't need to have such a high cadence because the dust response is, is smeared out by light travel time delays. So we could live with probably a cadence of about um, seven days, about a week, or, or maybe even slightly longer for higher luminosity objects. Does that answer the question? Yeah, seems like that's good. And, and may I ask, just re somewhat related to that, um, you know, for Euclid, why do they choose this particular cadence where they do seven visits in seven days every six months and, and then repeat? What, what, what's driving them to do it that way? Yes, I, I would, I'm afraid I, I wasn't able to really figure out what that, the motivation for that, that cadence is. Um, so I, I'm not really very familiar with the, the Euclid, um, or at least the science case for the, the, the deep field survey. Uh, so yeah, my, 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 my guess might be very distant supernovae or something, but. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that would be my guess too, uh, but it, it's it, even so, it seems a, an odd sort of choice for cadence. Um, that this is just what's publicly available on the on the um, project website. Okay. Okay. And let me see. Maybe we have. Let me see. If we have any. Ah, here's another question from from Paulo Copi. So, to to what extent is an isotropy beaming of the continuum illumination and possible variations? in that take it into account in the modeling? Okay, we, <coughs> we explicitly take that into account. So um, if I go back a few slides. So the uh, model response functions you see here, um, the, the red lines show uh, the response uh, for anisotropic illumination of the of the torus. So in this case, the, um, the degree of anisotropy is a factor of 10, meaning that the, the continuum uh, flux at the equator is 10 times less than the uh, continuum flux uh, along the poles. And the blue lines show the, um, show the, the uh, the same thing, but for isotropic illumination. Uh, so um, what you see is, I don't have the slide here, but the, 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 the sublimation zone has a, has a sort of waste. It's like a figure of eight. Actually, it's shown in a, 
one of the earlier slides. Find that. All right, so you can actually see that effect going on here. So the sublimation sphere in quotes, um, in this case, in this uh, model by Baskin and Lara also takes this effect into account. So um, <clears throat> the dust can extend further in towards the, uh, the continuum source in the equatorial plane than it can at higher, higher altitudes. And, and so this, this effectively shortens the response times. Okay, good. So then I think that wraps up the questions for that talk. And since we're at time, I think that will be the end of, of this session. Let me just remind you then that we have a sixth session uh, starting this afternoon, I believe at 2.50 p.m. It is session 316. And in that session this afternoon, we're gonna start off with one additional important talk by Sebastian Honig, who will tell us about the exciting uh, tides project to do AGN reverberation mapping. And then additionally, we will spend about an hour having a general discussion section. And, and during that, we plan to discuss metrics further. Um, and we plan to have a, a brief discussion perhaps of possible future meetings of the AGN science collaboration. And, and there will be time for open discussion if other people have points that they would like to raise or ask questions of the AGN Science Collaboration. We'll do whatever we can to be helpful there. So that's everything for now. And um, we'll look forward to seeing everyone this afternoon. Okay, take care.